Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's also a Masters World Champion and a Pan Ams Champion. He's a World Nogi Silver Medalist and a three time American National Champion. He's also a World uh, World Brown Belt Nogi Champion and a New York Open Champion, as well as a San Diego Open Champion. Uh, he's a World Professional Jiu Jitsu Cup Trials Champion and he's also a Grappler's Quest Champion. He's a veteran of Meta Morris, and you guys might know him as he went viral on the web as the ridiculously photogenic jiu-jitsu guy after a perfectly timed picture from one of his matches was posted online. Uh, these days, he's a highly respected instructor and teaches out of his own academy in San Diego, California. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today for the third time in my podcasting career by Clark Gracie. How are you today, Clark? I'm doing great, Ryan. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course, man. It's great to have you back. It's been a little while, man. I was looking back in the archive. I think the last time we had a conversation on air uh, was 2018. So it's been a little while, man. Catch us up. What have you been up to in the last uh, several years? Yeah, it's kind of seems like everything's uh, the timeline of, of the world and especially in jiu-jitsu as well. It's kind of like pre-COVID, yeah. post-COVID, right? Yeah, it's right. like it's COVID was scary, but we got through. I, I feel like I did a lot of podcasts about COVID and how, how things were, uh, you know, back then. And uh, it's so nice to be feeling like things are kind of normal again, you know? So it's, it's, it's awesome. You know, things are getting back to normal. Competition scene is, is back thriving, uh, the academies and, um, and people want to train again. So it's awesome. That is excellent, man. Yeah, I know. I know that California was a tough place to be, man. That was the. the I know the the restrictions on jujitsu were real hard out there uh, for longer than a lot of other states. So I'm really happy that your academy made it through and that uh, you're able to still do seminars and the competition scenes open back up. So yeah, like you said, it's great to be kind of out on the other other end of the storm, so to speak. Um, how, how how's your uh, seminar tour has been going? I know you tour. You go all over the world doing seminars. Has that been pretty active lately? Yeah, I mean, um, I, it was on pause for a long time because of the pandemic, but um, I actually just got back from Asia last week. I was uh, traveling around uh, Korea, Hong Kong, and, you know, just um, it had been a while since I had been to my affiliates over there. So it's, uh, it's good to be able to travel again and see the world kind of coming back to normal. It is good to see, man, especially since, you know, in the last several years, there's been so much growth in jujitsu. So for something to come along and shut everything down, kind of right as jujitsu is taking this huge upward peak in popularity, that was really tough. So I'm happy that uh, I'm happy that things are back to normal just for that alone. And kind of on that note, Clark, you know, with the amount of content that exists out there in jujitsu, um, whether it's through social media or through YouTube or whatever, students can often feel overwhelmed uh, with what aspect of their game they should be working on to improve. There, there's there's always been new technical advancements in jiu-jitsu obviously that's not new but at the, the speed in which they're seeing different types of advancements happening is faster than ever due to the internet the growth of popularity of the sport uh, all the streaming uh, competition events that people are seeing it can leave students yeah. sometimes in a constant state of ADD like regarding what they should focus on in their game in, in your opinion what are some of the most important fundamentals of jiu-jitsu that everyone needs to start with I think everybody has to know a bit of uh, understanding of just basic concepts of self-defense. You know, I think it's super important that we don't lose that aspect of uh, playing too much jiu-jitsu like it's a game and forgetting about someone could actually punch you at some point. You know, understanding that you do have to understand how to close the distance, how to get to the clinch, bring the fight to a, a position where you have have more control. And... Um, if someone grabs you and 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 they're doing things that aren't jujitsu uh, typical, you know, they're they're putting you in a, a weird headlock, you know, that that we don't do. It's not very, it's not a technical type of thing. Or someone's just throwing punches or knees and elbows, you know. So I think we need to preserve jujitsu as a as a, you know, I hate to say like self defense because it sounds like so, um, you know, stereotypical, you know. Uh, or, or a little bit like the softer side of jiu-jitsu, but I think we gotta we gotta you know or, or train a little bit of MMA you know just to understand to to avoid punches, but keeping keeping it alive in in that side and uh, and also you know just like the, the the straight fundamentals you know I think people get too wrapped up with like the newest um, guards that are coming out the newest sweeps, but really understanding like the real fundamentals you know like getting to like those solid fundamentals of closed guard the the strong sweeps and uh, i feel like everybody in my family kind of talks about that right <laughs> people in the, in the gracie family is like yeah you gotta have the self-defense down but it's it's real man you know uh, you know i sometimes I'm, I'm training with someone and i'm putting my i'm in the guard and i'm like seeing like does this does this blue belt really know like how to how to keep my pressure off of them you know and it's nothing nothing fancy that i'm doing you know just kind of like 
acting like I'm a street fighter and just putting my, my weight on them, putting my pressure on their neck and like I want to choke them from inside their guard. And a lot of people don't know the basic understanding of just putting the feet on the hips and, and making space and, you know, going for arm bars, things like that. They want to like do what they've been drilling uh, for, you know, to make that, that quick advantage point you know, in the competition. But, you know, it, it's beautiful, the, the art, that how it's grown and everything. But I think um, I think we need to preserve uh, the reality reality check of, of what we're doing with with the uh, the arts. I think that's a very valid valid point. And I, I think that's a that's a that's a legitimate concern. I think for any combat art or any combat sport, like if you were if you were a boxer and and you went out on the street and somehow got beat up in a in a in a, in a bar fight or something, you'd probably feel pretty bad about yourself. You know, it wouldn't be a good look knowing that hey, my style, my my art that I trained and practiced didn't work for me because of X, Y, and Z. And there's there's something that you said there that I find really interesting. You mentioned that um, someone puts you like in the street, people might do things that are very unexpected uh, and very different from what we would. We would experience in a training room with other jujitsu people like these you, you use the word a weird headlock someone might put you in some kind of weird headlock that normally a jujitsu guy wouldn't do so because of that you don't have a response to it how do you yeah. tra- how do you train for stuff like that what, what's the best way in a, in a self-defense training environment to prepare for like the unpredictable spazzy type of things that a guy on the street might might try to do Honestly, like training with white belts <laughs> right. you know? yeah. training with people that are that are new to the art and they're gonna grab you in ways that um, are unorthodox because it's just, you know, it's just like instinctual. It's not something that they've been taught to do. It's just kind of, uh, okay, grab the head, twist it, pull it, squeeze it. And, uh, and you know, it's, it might not be like your typical, uh, you know, guillotine, Ezekiel, uh, you know, rear naked choke like, uh, type of defense, you know? So um, I think it's just, it's good for us to, to put to train with those people man you know really if you train with a white belt it, it okay i was in korea last week right and <laughs> they had a a black belt train with me brown purple blue and white right and i and i said okay let me start with a black belt and i'll work my way down <laughs> and uh and honestly like the white belt was like one of the most intense ones you know it was like it's a it felt like a, i was sprinting the entire time this guy is just like you know, he'll probably die out in, in three minutes, but um, but it was exhausting because like the guy's just constantly flexing, constantly giving a hundred percent. And, uh, you know, it wants to, wants to you know, show off a little bit, you know, cause everybody's watching. And, uh, and it, it, it was the more intense of the, of the five people that I, that I trained with, you know? So, you know they're gonna they're gonna do things a little differently, and you and you feel like okay, the black belts, the brown belts, a little more calculated, will explode at the right time, will will do things a little bit more uh, customary, things that I'm used to, you know, type of passing, type of type of sweeps. Uh, although you know white belt, you know, you never really know. You know, it could be just a it's a wild card. You know. <laughs> That's very, it's very true. I mean, it, it really does, like you said, it replicates kind of a real, uh, like a training with an untrained person because what white belts sometimes uh, make up for in a lack of technique is, is intensity and, and strength and trying to explode yeah. out of things. And it, it, like we described, we describe a lot of people who train that way as spazzy, you know, but in real life, man, man, people are spazzy out there when you fight, you know, when, the, yeah. when adrenaline's high and you don't really have any real technique or skill, it's, it's, it's fury, it's, it's, it's adrenaline, it's spazziness kind of defined, you know? If we were to complain about spaziness, it's like, hey man, stop fighting so hard. You know, no, we got to be ready for that, right? Yeah, it's right. like, you know, we can't we can't uh, complain about someone being spazzy because it's real, right? It's reality. It's uh, you know, it's like okay, maybe it's not like a an enjoyable uh, role with a exchange of energy where we're you know just flowing together and it, and it feels beautiful and. You know, the energy is just, you know, back and forth and, and you're feeling you know, just the, the weight and everything. But you, you can't control is a reminder where you cannot control that other person uh, until you until you can. Right. So um, and sometimes those guys, they're, they're the last ones to tap to, you know, they don't, they might not even realize they're in a submission and they, they, they uh, they're going to keep fighting until the, the very end, you know, so.
Absolutely. Well, it's also it's also a nice reminder that when you roll with someone like that, it's, it's a good reminder to yourself uh, to bring it back to the importance of fundamentals that, man, a lot of times the very simple things in jujitsu are what works to control someone in, that's tr that's rolling like that or someone that, that in, in a self-defense situation that's behaving like that. Sometimes just the, the, the proper weight distribution of a side control uh, or of a cross face or or of a mount position uh, is really all it takes to subdue somebody completely. You know, you let them wear themselves out. You let them spaz out until they're until they're gassed out. And then you realize, like, man, some of the stuff that's the most efficient in jujitsu is the stuff that you might learn in your very first class. Have you found that to be the case as well? Definitely. The, the yeah, it's those basics, right? It's those fundamentals. It's nothing, nothing too crazy. Of course, you know, you can you can still make stuff happen, uh, but uh, yeah, you got to be got to be ready for those people that that are gonna you know just go from zero to a hundred, you know, in in seconds. And, um, and times that you're not expecting it. So I think it's a bit of a reality check. I also think it's good for people to train with bigger people to really see what, what really works. You know, they, they don't necessarily have to be your level. It could be a uh, lower level belt, but, um, but you know, I, you see people sometimes having a harder time doing moves on the bigger people. And, and that's really the essence of jujitsu, right? I mean, we think we hear about, uh, I don't know. I mean, jujitsu is going on a hundred years that it's going to be taught. You know, we're about at like 98 years or maybe right around 100 already. Um, but, um, you know, just knowing how to how to react with those with those type of uh, training partners. Absolutely. Oh, what, do you, what do you think are some of the keys uh, for, for people that are new to use the fundamentals well against bigger people? Uh, what, are, what are some some key details that you like to always emphasize with your students? I remember like many times training with people that are, you know, over 300 pounds, you know, and uh, feeling like, man, how's this role going to go? But uh, I really think like my, my idea of distance control, you know, understanding how to keep pressure off, you know, um, keeping, keeping someone from getting too tight on you. Uh, I fought Hafa Mendes one time, right? And I thought like, okay, this guy's like not a big guy, you know, but look how well he controls someone putting pressure on him, you know, like so, somebody should be able to smash through his guard, you know, but he just, he did, does such a good job of, of distance control and making sure the bigger opponent doesn't, uh, doesn't get, get heavy on him. Doesn't, isn't able to you utilize their weight. You know, we did a, a Meta Morris match and I'm a little heavier than him, but, um, you know, uh, you know, my, having an opportunity to pass his guard was like, you know, basically non-existent, you know, it's just, uh, it was, it was an awesome back and forth. And, and my strategy against him at the time was more like, uh, let me counter his bit and bowl. Or let me find ways to, to uh, catch him, you know, halfway through uh, on his attack. But, you know, we went the distance in that fight, but um, it was, uh, he, you know, he did such a good job of, of keeping control. And you see him do that. I think he fought uh, Holdolf Vieira one time. You saw like how, how well he, he fought against even guys in heavyweight division super heavyweight yeah. so yeah it, it really is something else when you feel someone do that like when you feel someone use mobility and and, and the idea of um keeping themselves out of pressure's way i had that experience myself i rolled with michelle nicolini yeah. I, I was trying to pin her in different ways and i it just no matter where i was trying to put my pressure she was just shy of being under my pressure and it was really fascinating like i could not i could not apply my weight anywhere it felt like and she was always at an angle always finding a way around to my back always finding a way to uh to reverse the position and it really is fascinating when you see someone that can do that so well so i think that's tremendous advice for smaller guys up up against big guys because ultimately man if you get your guard pass and the big guy is able to apply his weight down on you that's when the game starts kind of falling apart you know yeah test your test your jitsu against bigger people right and uh and i think also someone brought up to my attention like man that you can really feel the difference between someone who who's a competitor who who is kind of not necessarily even seasoned but just has those instincts to to know how much something is worth like you know like you training with michelle nicolini i mean she's probably a lot lighter than you and uh but she's she's so uh i would imagine i've never trained with her but she she you have to be so focus on like not making mistakes right not giving up any uh unforgivable grips and and allowing someone to really close the distance and, and put get pressure on you so it really keeps you like because you know one but wrong one wrong move 
and you're you're in a bad position. You're getting your guard passed. You're getting smashed. You're uh, you're defending off submission. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, Keeps you sharp. It absolutely does. Yeah, I think that really is valuable. I think a lot of people shy away from rolling with bigger people just for fear of injury or or feel of you know fear of getting smashed the whole round. But you know, the second one is is something that you should not be shying away from. You know, getting smashed through the rounds is how you learn to, to to do what we're talking about to keep yourself away from the pressure and keep yourself in good positions. So yeah, I agree. Definitely, definitely important to get out there and test yourself against bigger people. Um, and Clark, let me ask you this, man. Do you, do you feel that with the growth of the art, that things that were once considered fundamentals have changed like are other things that maybe were once upon a time were more considered like advanced or uh, concepts or techniques that nowadays are something students really need to learn early on in order to keep up definitely um you know i remember when i was a teenager you know probably like around 2000 or so lasso guard was like the new guard at the time you know like throwing on a lasso and i'm like all right let me play with this new guard and uh you know i kind of took to it and uh it was it was something that, that made sense to me and kind of like, you know, I found different sequences out of that position. And now people are saying, okay, you know, learn the basics, you know, get the old school, guy, like lasso guard, you know, lasso guards, like a simple guard, like that you just got to know, right? If, if you're going to, if you're a blue belt, you, you're expected to know a lasso guard. You'd be familiar with a, a few sweeps from there, what to watch out for, how to use it, how to apply it. So, I mean, you know, if, you, if you're a lasso guard, if, you, if you're a blue belt, let's say, which is, you know, you, you kind of say like you've mastered the basics, you've been, you've, you've seen the, all the major positions and you don't know some of these single leg eggs, butterfly guard, you know, if you're not decently uh, proficient in these, in these type of uh, guards, then you're kind of, uh, something's was left behind in your curriculum, right? So yeah, that's it's, it's become fundamental, right? It's in our jiu-jitsu, it's become that fundamental jiu-jitsu, these what used to be new is now, you know, kind of like the simple stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. How, how do you feel about leg locks being taught to, to, to beginner students? Because that's another area of jujitsu that's obviously exploded. Uh, it seems like even even for people that, you know, that are white and blue belts, when they when they go into tournaments and they don't know leg locks, they usually don't. They usually have a hard time. Uh, what are your, what's your opinion of that? I think people get scared of leg locks and tap pretty quick because they're like, man, you know, one thing that I can't live without is walking, right? I don't want to not be able to walk, right? Yeah. So people will get scared and tap early because they know the dangers of it. And also, I mean, it, uh, so, th so that kind of makes it an easy submission to go for. But if you kind of go in any direction, like one-sided, you know, if you're only doing triangles or if you only play top game, one of your, one side of your game is going to be kind of uh, limited, right? So I think it's important for us to try to be well-rounded as much as possible. You know, if you start to feel like, I always admire like the, the wrestlers that are like, will pull guard because that guy doesn't have to pull guard. You know, he he's confident on his feet. He has a good base. He probably loves passing guard, loves smashing, loves being on top. It's just kind of like ingrained into them from, from years of wrestling. But if they're willing to pull guard, that means they're willing to get out of their comfort zone and work on other things that are, you know, could be new to them and they want to, yeah. you know, become, become well-rounded. So, um, yeah, yeah. sorry, I lost track of your no, question. No, you're, no, you're good. No, I, was, <laughs> I was just asking if you, if you think that leg locks have a place in, in fundamental leg locks, yeah. these days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think like the IBGF has implemented the leg locks is a, is a, are, are those positions that, um, are easily, causing injury right so and uh, and and you don't necessarily feel it until it's too late right like you can be in a toe hold uh, a foot lock a knee bar and some something about the legs i'm not i'm not you know a doctor to say but you can like completely lock out your elbow and feel like okay my elbow is uh you know is extended and i feel like if it goes anymore it's going to break or you can lock, extend out your your knee and it's such a big strong joint maybe it has less uh nerves in it or something but you don't feel as dangerous so you kind of feel that it can uh, go a little further when a lot of times it can't you know and you hear about people popping their their knees uh getting you know ligaments kind of torn in like twisted angles and, and they just like let it go a little bit further i think because uh they, you know, you don't feel it as much. Right. And, and I think the same for the foot I've been in toe holds and then be like, uh, I think I can go a little more, a little more, I can hold out. And then all of a sudden it's tearing, you know? 
So uh, where, you know, I think like wrist locks, elbow, shoulder, you have a little bit more of a, like your brain gets those alert signals and, and tells you like you're in a bad spot, you know, pretty quick. I don't know. It's, it's a little different, even especially your neck. Your neck brings a lot of fear real quick, right? Your neck is in a, you know, bad dars or in a, in a, in a or you're getting choked unconscious. Like obviously you feel that you're, you're going out. So, um, I think it's, it's good that IBJ Jeff has like preserved those for the, kept those, those techniques for the upper belts because you got to know at that point. Um, it's made it interesting in the past few years, right? They, they brought in heel hooks for brown and black belt adult division. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's good, you know, and, and it seems like we're not seeing like that many people get injured, you know, way more, um, you know, that brings a little bit more completeness to, to the art in, in the, that side of competition. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's good. Absolutely, man. But I don't think it should be the only thing people teach, you know? I think it's it's easy to be, like, a really good leg locker and go out there and beat a bunch of people. Um, and I think it's, it's understudied, uh, especially defensive. And so people feel a like lack of confidence in the area and, you know, ends up being a very effective game plan. So. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this: As people get more advanced in the ranks, they, they like you said, they kind of tend to dive into more complex positions and techniques. What's a fundamental concept that you that you see advanced students sometimes forgetting or overlooking uh, as they get more into the complex side of jujitsu as as they advance in rank? Yeah, definitely the self defense. Definitely the self defense, like I said, uh, which is you know something that we don't we don't have the opportunity to to practice uh, that much because it's not part of the sport side and sparring side is something you just have to, you know, put yourself in those situations and create, you know, situations of, of, of risk and resistance. But, uh, I think that even like the simple, the simple guards, you know, the simple guards, uh, people get caught up doing the more fancy stuff and, and, you know, show me like a solid, armbar from the guard, you know, does everybody feel like good about applying that? Does everybody feel good about even like, look, man, it surprises me like the cross choke, you know, just, just going for that. Some people call it X choke, cross choke, cross collar choke, uh, from the front, you know, whether it's mount or bottom, you know, can you apply that? I think that the, the essence of that choke kind of tr translate into so many other chokes. Right. It's uh, even on the back, the back chokes, back collar chokes, uh, guillotines, using that that blade of your wrist to apply that choke efficiently is something that, you know, if you know how to do very well, the cross collar choke and you're not you know, super loose or using bad angles and just slaughtering that choke. I think uh, I think it translates into the other chokes very, very easily. So I, I actually get surprised on how many people don't feel confident using that choke. And you see. Uh, I mean, maybe not everybody who has watched it now because it's been a while, but back in uh, like 2010, 2008, back then when Hodger was uh, going out into the worlds and he was just, that was like all he was doing. He was like, okay, I'm going to either take you down or he's going to pull guard or sweep you, mount you, and then cross choke you. And I think he did that to to uh, like 90% of all his uh, his uh, opponents one year. And then one guy, he did like a Ezekiel. But I mean, to know, okay, like at that point, he's already done like six guys, I think even in the absolute division. So he probably did like 10 cross strokes. You know, it's coming, right? You know, it's coming and can you avoid it, right? So uh, it's, it's one of those super basics, right? It's one of those learn that, that you learn within like your first week, or I think you should learn within like very early on in your training, especially if you're training the gi. And people, you know, a lot of times don't know it, I, you know, I guess shocked you know or they know it but they don't really have the the knowledge to apply it in in sparring yeah no, it's, it's extremely important technique it's actually a, a technique that i use a lot in my game i i always say the cross collar choke is is like a key that opens a lot of doors right if some if you're on mountain someone's just completely tight and not giving you any any space to attack their arms or their limbs man applying a collar choke starts opening things up it starts making them having to open their elbows to defend the choke a little bit that allows you to change position a little bit uh, or start isolating arms uh so yeah that, that's that's a great point you brought up as far as things that people overlook um sometimes something as simple as just a, a 
old school cross collar choke is something that can lead to all kinds of other things in the game. So, uh, yeah, great, 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 great point, man. Uh, Clark, I'll tell you what, we've reached a point of the show here. This is where I always play a game with my guests. This is a game called the Pummel. Uh, the Pummel is basically right. a series of random questions. Some of these have to do with jujitsu. Some of them have nothing to do with jujitsu. Uh, but if you're down to play the Pummel, I'd love to play this game with you. All right, man. Don't. It's not gonna get too weird, is it? No, 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 no. Nothing weird. Nothing. Weird, I promise. <laughs> Just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So, uh, question one. Now, with you being a Gracie, you've probably never had a job outside of jujitsu, right? You've probably been doing just jujitsu your whole life, right? For for a career. <laughs> man, I've done all kinds of jobs, man. I oh, moved cool. to San Diego when I was nineteen. I was lifeguarding. You know? Okay. I was yeah. just yeah. I was working as a lifeguard, training jujitsu. I was trying to go to college. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, I just. I just focused on on that and uh, on, on jiu-jitsu training, and I ended up not not finishing college. But um, but yeah, I've, I've I've done all kinds of jobs. Okay, cool. <laughs> so the, early early twenties. So the, the first course, the first question I want to ask them: What's the worst job you ever had? Ooh, like uh, I think uh, I think being like a busboy, man. I mean, like cleaning under tables, and you got these responsibilities to like clean the bathroom at the end of your shift, and um, that didn't last too long, but I worked at a, at a restaurant in San Diego, you know, in, when I was about 20, uh, just, you know, there wasn't too many academies, uh, a tournament was like every three months maybe. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, <laughs> didn't have as much opportunity in jiu-jitsu at the time, yeah. but, um, yeah, I was a blue or purple, I was purple belt at the time, pretty sure, you know, and, uh. Yeah. So. Yeah. Bus. Bus boys. You got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do, man. But yeah, bus boys are yeah. not always. Bus boy is not a fun job. I, I did that myself. I, the thing I hated the most about that wasn't even so much the cleaning. It was that at the end of, at the end of the night, every other night they'd alternate who has to wrap all the silverware for the next day, like in the napkins with a little paper. Uh, yeah. Dude, that would take forever. Like if you if you get if you got caught with it, if it feels like a Friday night and you want to go out with your friends after work and they said, hey, you got silverware tonight, you're like, damn, you have to like call everybody and be like, yeah, I can't make it. I'm gonna be here for hours wrapping silverware. So. Thank God for jujitsu, man. I'm glad. I'm glad that you don't have to do that anymore. What, what do you yeah. th What do you think is a secret <laughs> talent that you have? Ah, uh, man, the omoplata. <laughs> I mean, it's not a secret, but no secret. There's yeah. a lot of little secrets in there, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think like as long as I worry, like man, this omoplata stuff does it can't die with me, you know. It has to. It has to go, you know. And so other people have to pick it up, you know. Uh, I hope to see other people using it really well. But um, usually when I see people do it, I'm like, see some d details missing, you know, but, um, but yeah. How about some, how about some, how about something outside of jujitsu that you're good at? Um, <laughs> definitely not good at being a buff boy. Let's see. Um, <laughs> man, I, uh, I don't know. What am I good at outside of jujitsu? You know, I just, um. I don't have any like really special talents uh, other other than you know it's more, I'm more like I've always been better with like using my body and stuff, but <clears throat> I mean I, I enjoy like just being in nature and and doing stuff like that. But nice. I mean I spend so much time focusing on 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 the mat, you know, and and I think you know teaching is is another passion of mine. I really enjoy teaching, but um, uh. Yeah, I just you know I like I like the family life, uh, you know, being a father and stuff like that. That's all. well, dude. Te teaching is definitely a talent, man. That's some. That's not something that everybody can do. There's people who are like incredible True. world champion uh, fighters that that don't teach very well. You know, like they, they kind of they're just kind of known for being athlete, but not yeah. really a teacher. It's, it's that's definitely a talent, man. Uh, what's something you wish you were better at? If you could if you could pick like a like a hobby or an activity outside jujitsu that you wish you could do really well, uh, what would it be? Man, I, I like surfing. You know, I like surfing, but, and I see people do like magic on the waves out there, you know, and I'll, I'll do it for fun here and there, but like, I wish I was like, you know, a high level surfing. That would be pretty cool. That'd be cool. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm able to do it just like moderately for fun, you know, That's awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, 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 I think it's a beautiful sport. That's all. Yeah, just surfing is really cool, man. That's, that's something I want to get into myself. I just have to. I just have to get over my fear of sharks. So I, once I can do that, I'll, I'll be out there surfing <laughs> yeah, with everybody. Yeah. What, what do you think is the worst injury you've ever had in jujitsu? I've been so lucky, man. I, I, I think I have a stretch routine that I've done, you know, since uh, purple belt really, and I've never really had too much uh, bad luck. You know, every time I have gotten injured, it's been one of those days that I didn't didn't stretch usually. Uh, I've had some like lower back injuries where I think it's mostly muscular. Um, 
that kind of like made it where I couldn't even walk up stairs. But luckily, it just kind of like faded within like a week. Um, some knee, some knee issues, but I never had to have any surgery. Um, you know, just like silly, like little stuff. One time, like my, my finger got completely pulled back and I couldn't like close my, my finger all the way yeah, like damn, that, dude. you know, it just like stuck out, you know, but it's kind of like silly injuries, you know, but I've been super, uh, super lucky. And I think just from training from a young age has made me very aware of like being, uh, not getting caught in dangerous situations on, mm -hmm. on the mat, you know, just keep myself safe all the time. Yeah, I was gonna say that must be a testament to how you train for sure. Because man, if you're a if you're a member of the Gracie family and a full time teacher and a competitor and everything else, and you can, you don't have a long list of injuries, that means you're doing something right for sure. So that's uh, that's that's really good. It's a good example for for everybody. Um, what, what do you think is uh, your favorite bad food to eat? Favorite junk food? Um, you know, I can have. Uh, I, I try. To, I think I don't have like too much of a sweet tooth, but some people in my family say I have a bit of a sweet tooth, but um you know just um just like sweets a little bit but i think i, I balance it out with like good training and uh, the rest of the good things in my diet <laughs> that's awesome what, yeah. what, what's something what's your most hated food what's something you can't eat no matter what man i really tried to like this uh fruit you know you think like how could you hate like some fruit so much but uh it's this fruit that you find in asia i don't know if you've heard of it called durian oh yeah sure have you heard, sure. Of, have you heard of durian yeah. man like uh it's very hard for me to be, I like, I've tried to like it, you know, but yeah, I mean, durian, man, I, I've, I think I learned about it first time in Thailand and uh, they, it's like a delicacy, but there's some hotels that you'll see uh, saying, I have signs like no durian allowed in this hotel because it stinks, man. Yeah, it like, yeah. it smells like, uh, you know, pineapple and, uh, and garlic or something mixed, you know, <laughs> it, you know it, it, it smells like a, a garbage water, but some people love it, man. Some people love it. And I sometimes I think you have to have like that that Asian gene to uh, to really appreciate it like for sure. what it is. <laughs> is it like is, but, uh, it, is it a slimy fruit? It's it's slimy too, isn't it? Or yeah, no? yeah, it's, it's, slimy. it's very similar to like jackfruit, right? Jaca, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jaca, yeah, which uh, is is super uh, also supposed to be really nutritious, but um, you know, and jaca is good. You know, I think like jaca is really good, but durian, man, it's. Uh, it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I feel you on that. Yeah, I've never, I've never had durian, but I, I, I'm familiar with what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll try it someday. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I like to try yeah. everything. But yeah, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's what you described, the combination of like garlic and pineapple, I, I probably am not going to like it either. But I'll give it a <laughs> yeah. try anyway. What do, you, what do you think was the scariest moment of your life? Scariest moment of my life. Uh, well, you know. Probably there's probably a lot of different ways to, to do that, but I I did I never did too many extreme sports, you know. But I did bungee jumping one time in New Zealand. Oh wow! And man, that was that was uh, that was you know a lot of fear all at once, you know, <laughs> all at once. And you know I could like step on the mat to fight, you know, absolute divisions and and fight any of these big name competitors and think like okay, the worst is gonna happen. I'm gonna tap, you know. <laughs> That's you know I just. You know, it's just like, it's gonna be ten minutes of of hell here, but to like step off and like feel like you're gonna die, you know. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, I never did skydiving, but um, I don't know, feeling like uh, you know, you got you just have this thing, this harness around your your waist, and you're just stepping off, and you see the 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 ground, or in this case, it was a lake below me. <laughs> Yeah, bungee jumping was pretty scary. That's that's pretty intense. But there's a thing I've seen people do on YouTube where they're. It's usually like the instructor, like the one that's overseeing uh, everyone jumping and making sure their straps are on properly and their clips are on. They do this thing where everything is perfect, and then right as they jump, they say, "Wait, I didn't clip you." Like right yeah. as you're jumping, it's like, dude, that's the most <laughs> cruel. That's so horrible. Yeah. And the person yeah. falling, like they really think they're gonna die. And so, yeah. like, oh man, if it was if, as if it wasn't adrenaline inducing enough, you know? Yeah, that's pretty rough. That's, that's brutal, man. <laughs> terrible, terrible. What do you think is um? What, what's your most hated position in jujitsu to get stuck in? Um, man, I I used to hate being stuck in fifty fifty. But man, you get like stuck in a bad triangle, man. That's like a real test of your character, I think, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> you know, squeezing your head out of a bad position or, um, you know, when you're, especially when your ear is like folded backwards, yeah. you know, and you're in that triangle and you're like, man, I'm going to get some cauliflower out of this. <laughs> uh, 
you know, yeah, it's, it, being stuck in a bad triangle is, is pretty rough. That's a bad one for sure. I think everyone can relate yeah. to that. That's definitely a bad one. Uh, what, what's your, what do you think is your favorite match that you've had in your career? Um, one of the guys that, you know, I think uh, when I was a young black belt was uh, one of the moments where I was like, I really had to like, like it was a growing moment for me. And uh, I think a lot of people, you know, thought it was, it was a big deal for me when I fought, uh, I think it was like 2011 was the first time I fought Andre Galvão and I actually fought him in 2011 and 2012, both of the same tournament at uh, Abu Dhabi trials in, in San Diego. And uh, I remember thinking like, okay, I had trained with Andre before, but I was like purple belt at the time. And I know I had good, good matches with him, but then, um, you know, it had been a while and he had been making a name for himself and he had just moved to San Diego uh, and he, he was starting his academy. And uh, and I also am from San Diego. So, you know, I had like a big, big following at the time in San Diego. So it was like a pretty cool moment to like have the whole crowd, like, you know, cheering for me and stuff like that. But um, but that was that was a cool day, you know, because like I, I went through half of the bracket and then it was like, OK, come back tomorrow and fight in the semifinals and then that's when I fought Andre. So, uh, and it was, uh, you know, thinking about it, like through that day, you know, like the, the, that day and the next day thinking like, all right, well, you know, I think it was a great moment for me. Cause I felt like I have nothing to lose. You know, I'm like, I'm a new black belt and, uh, and Andre has been, you know, I think like nine time world champion or something at the time. And he still did a lot more after that. And he was, you know, still like in his prime, you know, like he was in his late twenties and, um, it was, it was just a great, like, uh, great, great, like, f match for me to have. And we actually tied that day. You know, it was it was zero zero, man. And um, and so that was like a huge confidence booster for me, you know. And, uh, you know, I had a, like a few attempted sweeps on him and like, you know, try to take him down. But, you know, like he was in my guard the whole time and I felt him getting tired and then thinking like, man, uh, like I'm doing okay, you know. Like I kind of feel like I'm I'm doing I'm doing better than I thought, you know. And uh, and he was always a guy that I actually looked up to. I admired his jujitsu. And uh, it's funny because like two weeks before, I said, "Hey man, we just moved to San Diego. That's awesome. Let's get together and train," you know. And then like two weeks later, we, we were in a tournament together, you know, in the same division. So <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, like I have a lot of respect for the guy. We we've done like camps together even afterwards. Uh, I did a camp with him in Turkey, which was awesome. Got to spend time with him after that and um you know i remember when he was a new black belt and he was you know always very dynamic and, and so it was, it was fun to watch you know but um for me that was like a great like something to kind of overcome you know like my own uh fears and and what i what i can become you know but i fought a lot of great guys after that uh, a lot of big names but that was like one of the first first like really big names i think in jiu-jitsu one of those like uh, guys that was just like a regular champion that i uh that i had to like you know just have it's probably i had like it wasn't like okay your next fight's gonna be him it's like your next fight's gonna be him tomorrow so you have like all day and in the morning to think about it you know before going out there so it's like a lot of anticipation yeah you know? That's incredible. Well, what a cool, I appreciate you laying that out, man, because that really is a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting dynamics that are within that story. Uh, let me ask you this. This is something I've asked to many members of your family mm -hmm. that I've interviewed over the years. Does having the last name Gracie add extra pressure to you when you're out there competing? And if so, how do you manage that? I think so, man, because even when like no one knew who I was, uh, especially like Purple Belt, you know, I'm coming out there and it's like, who's this guy? Clark Gracie. You know, okay, he has the last name Gracie, so we kind of expect something out of him, you yeah. know. So you kind of have some some eyes on you. You don't go go through just like this shadow, you know. So whether you whether you have anything, whether you're good or not, like people are gonna expect something about you and, and it's gonna be a big deal when you when they beat you, you know, if they're able to beat you, it's gonna be a big deal. And I think yeah, especially earlier days, you know, like 2000 early 2000s like jiu-jitsu was just making like starting to make noise you know it was just starting to have uh, champions you know I, I mean there was the world champions started out in like 96 97 something like that yeah. and so there was only you know it was like less than 10 years of, of world champions that were 
that had been, you know, ranking up. So the Gracie name was still like, these guys are, you know, some, some people that we, we look up to in jiu-jitsu, you know, I mean, nowadays there's so many, right. So, you know, and, and there was a lot of Gracie's, but there still are a lot of Gracie's, but not as many like competing anymore. So it was, a uh, it was, it was a big deal for, for us. Definitely like my generation, because so many people are getting good at jiu-jitsu already. And, uh, and there's pressure from like our father's generation, you know, like our, the uncles, the, the older cousins that they're out there fighting before people really knew jiu-jitsu, whether it was MMA or it was, uh, you know, those early world championships, you know, they're kind of leading the, they're leading the, the, the top of the cream of the crop, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I so there's a lot to work up to. I, I imagine, yeah. And, you know, I ask that because you know, for anyone that's ever competed before, we all feel like you know pressure, and we feel like, oh man, everybody's a big audience, and oh, I don't want to let my team down, and blah blah. There's all the pressures that people feel. I can imagine that, yeah, that coming from 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 the Gracie family, that that's got to be an extra layer. So I was curious to hear how you manage that because I think it, I think if, if if you can manage something like that, and the extra extra levels of pressure that most people don't deal with, I think people listening that compete who have just regular layers of pressure that might help them cope with some of those nerves a little bit and what, what helped you get over that because eventually obviously you, you, you know, you've done tremendously well in competition um, what, what helped what helped you not let that psych you out so much I think really like just embracing it you know embracing the, the pressure embracing the adrenaline and uh, you know other things happen in my life where it's like uh oh what am I gonna do now and it's like you know but you have those intense moments in your life in competition that help you know create this like thick crust over your character where you're just like, if that doesn't break me and I don't like, you know, go running the other direction, then I can probably handle a lot, you know, a lot of what other people can do. Uh, what, what other struggles that might come, come onto your, uh, upon your life. But, you know, I've had people say like older, older generations say, what's the work, worst that's going to happen? The worst going to happen is you're going to tap or, um, you know, one thing that's kind of stuck with me, some like a, a coral belt said to me one time, like, man, go out there for you. Don't go out there for carrying the weight of your family or your team or worrying about your students or reputation. Just go out there for you, you know, just go out there. Just, it's just you and another person out there, you know, just, just go, you know, and, and uh, nobody's doing any magic out there. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, hocus pocus going on. It's just, it's just you and another person in the gi or, or not in the gi, whatever. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, try to replicate those like you know tough training days and you're like okay yeah you know you're trying to train hard in the academy so that that the days in the competition are less intense and 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 uh are, are not even as hard as the worst training days that you have right so train hard to make those tough days easier right and uh and then one, one of the things that stuck with me you know is like embracing just the battle you know and and just really going out there to because you're you're hungry to battle don't even think about like i have to win i can't lose i have this fear of of getting you know anxiety in the middle of the fight and 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 getting behind on points or feeling like you're not going to win just go out there because you're hungry for for battle and that's something that's kind of hard to instill in yourself but it's something that you can like search for within yourself you know like you can you can kind of look for that feeling of and i think it's important to find it you know but like that feeling of like wanting to just battle you know and and digging deep inside of you where you just you want to just like get out some aggression or you want to you know just uh test yourself or put yourself in an intense environment for that you know limited period of time beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu is you know you can you know have a crazy match and hug it out at the end and be like thanks for the great fight and and be friends afterwards and you know have, have an amazing community amazing relationships uh even off your team so um that's a beautiful thing about it but i think you know once i really embrace the side of like just going for the, for the battle and not for the win like thinking like i have to win i can't i can't lose uh that took a lot of pressure off and just and just fighting for me, you know, just fighting for me and uh, not worrying about, you know, how I'm going to potentially disappoint family members or <laughs> anything like that. Because in the end, I think really in the end, in the end, it's uh, it sticks with you. It doesn't really stick anywhere else, you know, like 
people will eventually forget about you, forget about the rep, your reputation, good or bad. You know, it eventually will fade. But uh, the experiences and and the the character building and all those like uh, tough situations that you put yourself to encounter and confront, you know, even confronting your own feelings and fears and all that, mm-hmm. that's that sticks with you, right? And it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. So I think that's like one of the biggest things about it. And luckily, I was able to have people push me in the right direction and uh, and stick it out to to get through it, you know. And, and luckily, I was generally healthy the entire time. You know, I, I stay healthy and I could, I was able to continue competing for a really long time. Wow. What an outstanding answer, man. I really appreciate that, Clark. That was awesome, man. I, I, there's something you Thank said you. there I, I really I really appreciated. You mentioned that, you know, sometimes sometimes when people have an obstacle or pressure coming on them, the idea is to try to get away from it, try to let it not be part of their part of their day or part of their life. And I like what you said that sometimes the best thing to do is just embrace it, man. Just 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 latch onto it and accept that that's what it's going to be and find that inner that inner drive towards battle and towards, you know, not relieving the pressure and just, you know, really facing it head on. I, I really like that man i think that's very helpful to a lot of people even those that don't carry the gracie name i think that's very helpful going into matches and uh, and, and tournaments and things like that so thank you for that um a final question for the pummel game clark uh if if a zombie apocalypse breaks out right now in san diego what's the first thing you do man that's uh that's the scary question <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time in San Diego, like maybe 10 years ago, there was a power outage from here to Arizona oh, damn. and, uh, and everybody was freaking out, man. It only lasted like half a day, but everybody's freaking out. The, the, the grocery stores were emptied out. Oh, no. <laughs> people were, people were running like, you know, there's no traffic laws anymore. Oh. Uh, you know, like, Pandemonium. Just for, you know, until the afternoon. But, uh. I don't know, man. That's a really good question. I should probably prepare myself <laughs> for uh, for something a little bit more. I think that's something that, you know, yeah, I have a lot of friends that are like in the military and they have like, or, or were in the military and they have this mindset of like, you know, end of the world, you know, be prepared yeah. kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Preppers. But yeah. um, I don't know, man. Um, that's a good question. Probably like call all the black belts I know and just be like, hey, man. Let's get together and like hold down the fort together and <laughs> Lock down build our own little army. You know, <laughs> so awesome. yeah, create a compound or something. I don't know. I always uh, figure if, if you're on the coast, man, having access to like a big boat with lots of supplies would be good. So you just get out on the water. I don't. I don't think zombies swim. I've never seen a movie where zombies yeah. swim. So I don't know. Maybe getting out in the water and just waiting things out a little bit. I don't know. There's some good options if you're on the coast. I think. I love that idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of like. Uh, I, I don't really like the. The idea of being like too landlocked, too deep in, I always kind of like been drawn towards the coast. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's like in the back of my mind where I can always swim away from my problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Grab a boat and go. Yeah. Surf away. I feel you. <laughs> hey Clark, that was the final question for the pummel game, man. Congratulations, you win. You got your double underhooks. <laughs> oh yeah, nice. <laughs> So Clark, man, you, obviously you're world renowned for your proficiency with the Oma Plata. And uh, it just so happens that that's something I'm really trying hard to get better at in my own game at the moment. So I'm gonna use my position here to very selfishly pick your brain uh, on this topic. What do you think are some of the biggest misunderstandings that people commonly have with the Oma Plata? Uh, you know, it's funny, like I have to tell people all the time, like your butt is not glued to the ground. You know, you can move your hips, you know, and people try to squeeze the arm with their legs and they become like a, like a, like a tight rock, you know, just like a tight, like statue and statues have no movement, right? You still have to move. You still have to have hip movement. You have to make it like minor adjustments at a lot of times. It's where you're carrying your weight, where your hips are in relation to your partner's body, how your partner is moving, whether they're moving forward, sideways, backwards, up, you know, you have to kind of uh, make adjustments according to to your partner's energy. So when I'm teaching Oma Pilata, you know, which I actually have a class Wednesday nights that's like dedicated to only teaching Oma Pilata that, that the, the students kind of requested. So I focus on, on just Oma Pilata on those days um, or everything around Oma Pilata. It's, uh, it's a class that I, I find that, you know, I have to really dig into detail and realize that there's just a lot of those like micro adjustments and and it just helps me you know, dig a little deeper into it. But um, yeah, keep moving, keep moving and, and, and look for, you know, 
ways to finish that are not necessarily always the shoulder either. You know, there's a, you know, a lot of variety of different ways to finish the omoplata too. And I really think it's one of the strongest positions in jiu-jitsu because even for MMA, uh, even for street fight situation, because the person is no longer able to headbutt you, punch you, kick you, you know, you just can't let them pick you up off the ground and then smash you down. But um, there's ways to control that too. But yeah, uh, your, your hips, hip movement as anything in the guard, right? As anything when you're on your back is, uh, is so crucial. And, but in this case, it's more about like not just hip movement, but like in relation to your partner, you know? So uh, getting your hips behind your partner's hips is a really important movement. Everybody teaches omoplata to pull your partner sideways. And it's really just kind of, you know, I tell that everybody, look, I learned it that way. Everybody has taught it that way for years. But it's, it's super unrealistic after you're sitting up, grab a person by the belt and pull them over. Um, you know, it's only been like a handful of people that have really used the omoplata proficiently in competition and, and shown like how they can do it well. But um, yeah, I mean, I, sh I shared a lot of that on my BJ Fanatics uh, instructional. So that's a it's a great tool to be able to uh, dig a little deeper into like the variety of ways to finish and variations of uh, how to move and how to react depending on what your partner is doing. That's excellent. Uh, let me, let me yeah. ask, what, what are some of your favorite entry points to the omoplata? Like what are some of your favorite positions that you like to use that you feel lead to omoplata as well? And uh, what are some of your favorite setups in general? Man, um, I mentioned lasso guard before. I used to love to do it from lasso and I would do it so much that I think people kind of caught on to, to what it was how I was doing it. Uh, I think I haven't done it for a while and, and people are starting to forget about it. So I'm kind of bringing a comeback <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> with the lasso <laughs> guard, you know, and, and doing like the simple setups again. And it, it, it's working, which is fun. Um, but uh, I like to do, I like to get a lot uh, of plata on scrambles a lot of times, even when the person is like, you know, trying to get my back, you know, the when they're looking for an attack and then all of a sudden I'm able to, just, you know, find that hole right under their arm, shoot my leg through and, uh, and I'm there, you know, or, um, I love the trickery side of jiu-jitsu, right? You're like playing tricks on people, setting traps and Omoplata is a great, great, uh, sub uh, submission for that kind of mentality, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, I like to, to do it. I, I really, I should probably do another, uh, instructional with, with BJJ Fanatics on the Omoplata because I have a lot. I got through like about half on that first Omoplata <laughs> instructional that I, uh, that I had planned like to teach. And uh, I filmed for five hours and it, was, uh, it wasn't everything that I had, you know, so I want I wanted to actually do more. Oh man, you definitely got to come back and film more for sure. Yeah, because the first yeah. the first one was so great, man. It really it's really helped me a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, let, let me ask you this: uh, when it comes to when it comes to um, when you get to the omoplata position, you've done the entry properly, you've landed there uh, before the finish and before you decide to transition somewhere else. What are the most important like points of control that you like to emphasize with people to not lose the position? Uh, what, what are some what are some things you think are really important, both in gi and no gi, to not lose that position? Yeah, my, my control in gi and no gi kind of are a little different on how I like to secure the position, how I like to hold and make sure it doesn't slip away. You know, but I think that's the most important thing is like you are on the omoplata and knowing how to kind of move with it and not lose it, but understanding that you can be on the bottom, you can be on top, you can be on your side. You just follow it. You just kind of, I really feel like you're kind of like surfing the, the person as they, as they roll forward and roll sideways and, and uh, a lot of times you're, you're stopping momentum, their, their movement with like hooks and, you know, using your outside leg. But um, it's kind of a hard answer to, it's, hard, it's a hard thing to answer because there's just, um, it, it, there's a lot of, you know, little details that, that create a complete position. But body control, you know, getting, getting over the body, don't stay on your back. People a lot of times stay on their back too long and then letting the person spin out, roll out, uh, jump over, step over the head, you know, so we can't let that happen. Like pretty much getting up as soon as you can, you know, and I've obviously learned that many ways, the hard, many times the hard way, just not being able to not, not uh, giving as much value as I should have. So like getting up in time, but 
you know, learning that lesson, putting that sense of uh, priority in, in my mind when I'm applying that position has, has given me a, a lot of great results, you know, and, and also just not giving up on it, you know, being a little stubborn, you know, get, get to your position and wh whatever position it is, sometimes there's a lot of, you know, whether it's a footlock, whether it's a, a guillotine, you know, a kimura, whatever, there's a lot of like little, little adjustments that you have to make and let the position like full, like run its, run its course, you know, like let, let the person kind of like make their adjustments. Cause a lot of times they'll give you, uh, the person will, will open doors for you. You know, you'll see even like two black belts fighting and then you're like, wait, what are they doing? Why are they not? Why are they kind of just like in pause mode right now? Why are they not moving at this very moment? You know, cause they've kind of created a stalemate for each other. And one person is feeling this sense of urgency where they got to move. And then when they decide the other person is looking to capitalize, so then it really becomes like that chess match, right? Where it's these little movements, these little micro decisions that they're making to change a grip, to move their hips, to elevate, to create space, whatever it is. And, uh, and the other person is looking to counter, capitalize, and take advantage of that, of that movement, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of anticipation in Jiu-Jitsu. And what plot is no, uh, no exception to that rule. That's that's a very good point. Yeah, I also like that you've emphasized here that the omoplata really is a very dynamic position. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot that goes on. <clears throat> that's one of the things that I've learned most as I'm as I'm diving more and more into omoplatas later in my jujitsu uh, journey is that I always thought of the omoplata as a submission. Now I think of the omoplata more as a series of events that can happen, right? It's a transitional position. It can be a, it can be a submission, obviously, if you finish it, uh, but it can also lead to causing them to react in different ways that allow me to have completely different transitions than what I initially was going for. Have you found that having a good mental map in your mind of what basically responses to your opponent's defenses is something really important if you're gonna play omoplata? Yeah, responding to your opponent's defenses, definitely. Um, I think to have a complete position, you have to know how to create uh, the correct responses to your partner's uh, defenses, right? And, and understand all the ways that they can escape, right? If they're able to pull off an escape that you weren't expecting, that's when they're probably going to escape, right? You weren't, you weren't ready for it. You didn't expect it. So you have to be able to anticipate your partner's next move. You have to be able to read your partner's uh, tendencies, body position, and kind of get a general uh, an idea of, of what they're about to do before they do it. And then you create barriers, right? You create those, those barriers and, and stop them from being able to move forward in that, in that direction. So any, any submission is complete, completed by reading your partner fully through and, and understanding their their ways of escaping and, and be able to block those escapes. But yeah, um, digging in, digging into the counter counteractive like side of things. Did I answer your question though? You did. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You did. Yeah. 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 yeah that's it's something. It's something that I that I've realized is like I said is 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 that it's such a great transitionary position where you know maybe if you yeah. don't get the submission itself you might be able to, to to get the guy to roll forward. Now you're in side control. You might be able to roll backwards and yeah. up and north south. There's all all kinds of things that can happen off the omoplata, and that's that's been a big revelation I've had in my own my own game is seeing it for for what it is, not just being a, a simple submission. It's it's actually this very dynamic transitionary kind of position that happens it definitely yeah. is yeah i i personally and and especially in my history i've always thought of like getting to Moplata and i have to like i put in my mind like i'm going to finish this i'm not going anywhere else i might sweep but i'm gonna i'm gonna continue with the finish even after that you know now i've kind of like lost uh, that drive to like only do omoplata so much and being like if i get to omoplata it has to be only, only omoplata you know maybe sometimes we'll, we'll transition to other things but i think to really be make a make a mark you know create like a, a reputation of on a with a certain move you have to like really be determined to finish the submission you know, that, that you want, you know, and, and not like, because I think a lot of people get impatient in the Omoplata and say, okay, I'm going to transition and just let them sweep themselves. And I'm going to just follow it and end up on top, or I'm going to switch to a triangle, I'm going to switch to something else. And that's uh, when, uh, you know, they give up a, think about it really, you're giving up a submission for points or just for a position, you know, 
but I think, you know, you, you really can keep working and um, not giving it up. So yeah. being a little stubborn sometimes is good. Absolutely. Well, you, you use two examples uh, in the way people move in, in different positions. You mentioned rocks, people who like lock onto the arm like a rock. And you mentioned people who kind of surf through positions. I think that the more dynamic things like omoplata, being a surfer is a good way to go. It's, it's being able to float through and, and follow things wherever they go and staying with what you're going after is very valuable rather than just trying to lock in and focus on one thing. So uh, very well said, man. I, I, this is great advice. I really do appreciate it. Let me ask you this. We, we, we talked earlier about uh, rolling with big people uh, and, and using jujitsu effectively against big people. I'd like to apply that to omoplatas. So let's say absolute division, 150 pound guy is up against a 250 pound guy. What keys of success does he need to have in his mind if he's going to use an omoplata well? Well, omoplata, first of all, is just like, I think a great move to use against a bigger person because you're using two legs versus one person's arm and that person's arm is in a very uh, weak position in order to create uh, create resistance, right? Because it's kind of like bent behind their back or whatever. Uh, but you know, yeah, I mean, you're using using angles, right? You're using angles of the of the arm. You have to have a clean setup. You have to be you know one step ahead, which probably you are already just for have, to have gotten there. You have to be a little bit ahead of the game, and uh, and keep yourself ahead. You know, don't let your person the the opponent catch up to to their defense so um and a lot of that has to do with hip position where your hip is 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 uh in relation to your opponent and and how far you uh, you, you let your partner opponent go you know again like i said before anticipating their their escape but uh i think omoplata is a fantastic position to use against bigger person um, and it's usually what i end up like you know thinking like, okay i might not be able to to really get this person off balance because they have an incredible base. I might not be able to, uh, you know, get even to the top position. I might not be able to control their posture, like doing a triangle where they might smash me when I'm doing the arm bar on them. But the omoplata is one that keeps your, your spine generally in like a safe position. You're not getting stacked. You're not getting smashed. You know, you still have a lot of movement, you know, kind of like that crab walk style of movement on your hips. And, um, and then understanding how to like surf and roll and s stick with your partner as they spin and whatever they're doing, you know, uh, becomes a really fun position and, and great to use against a, a bigger person. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Let me ask you this, that the, the classic uh, fo uh, 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 ridiculously photogenic jujitsu guy image, you're hanging from the omoplata. The guy, you're in the omoplata, the guy stands up. What is your, yeah. what, what's your go-to, uh, your go-to options from there when you're actually being elevated in the air and hanging there? What, what, what do you like to do from there? Yeah, I mean, I actually tried like both of my go-to moves in that fight and uh maybe even three if you consider like the preventative but you know i was uh got the omoplata and i felt the guy starting to stand so i made sure i had the right grips to number one not slip away right because a lot of people end up just like shaking the person off and, and slipping their arm out so i made sure i had the correct grips and the correct body position to like keep the the move and i tried to grab his leg right as he went up to, to stop him from elevating but i just missed it you know so he was able to get me off the ground and uh you know it's not necessarily what i want to be but i felt fine in the in the means of like i'm not gonna uh slip off this position i'm not gonna let it go easily and i tried two things that i like to do i think the first one i, I try to go backwards i try to in the air i try to bring my head sounds really weird but i try to bring my head like between his legs uh on the back side you know yeah try to spin him back so it ends up twisting him and gets him off balance and brings him down but oh wow uh this this guy had a if you watch the video of uh of that omoplata which is the new york open i think 2012 uh it shows how i was trying to do that and i tried to rock him a couple of times and he didn't go down so he had a really good base and then i was able to go plan b and use my outside leg to hook under his far leg which kind of anchored him back down and, and brought him back to the floor so those two ways are really the, the two ways to bring your partner back down. But of course, there's a lot of like underlying uh, grips and, and connections that you have to make to avoid the person from slipping away in the first place. You know, just like be able to maintain the position, number one, and then number two, bring the person back to, 
ground zero and finish that fight. That makes perfect sense. Well, I appreciate you elaborating on that because I think yeah, a lot yeah, of people. Sure. I think a lot of people that end up in that position just assume, oh man, this is this is a defended uh, attack. Now I'm not going to be able to do anything else from here because I'm I'm kind of just hanging here. It's good to know that yeah, that there's still definitely options from there. You just got to know what to do. So, uh, and speaking of options and knowing what to do, guys, if you want to learn more about the Alma Plata system, uh, I mean, this is one of the best guys in the world to learn it from, and he has an, a great instructional with us here at BJJ Fanatics. It's called Automatic Alma Plata System. And it's available right now at bjfanatics.com. It's one of our best sellers. So you guys go and check it out. Um, Clark, in closing, man, what are some of your major goals for 2023? What are some things you hope to accomplish by the end of the year? Man, I'm, I'm really just loving the lifestyle um, that Jiu Jitsu is giving, you know, just enjoying, like, I'm pretty much, you know, just loving this, the teaching side of Jiu Jitsu. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to continue to choose one tournament a year one maybe two just because i don't want to get too comfortable i want to have that that challenge uh at least once a year in my life where i have to like really push myself to get out of my comfort zone and and get into that tra hard training mode and and get that like complete body soreness you know and uh and have a goal something to train for so um i might i might end up doing world masters in, in uh, august september nice the end of the end of that one in vegas so i might look for that one and um but just just enjoying you know just uh, the the life that jiu-jitsu gives and uh, you know, the community and you know everything that comes along with with training on a regular basis just staying uh you know you see a lot of people uh open an academy and barely show up or or create a business and just kind of like be able to like see it like uh, run itself and just kind of like take a step back, but I'm, I really enjoy it, man. Like I, I like I, every time I show up at the academy, I'm just like I'm going to a party. You know, what I mean, I'm just I'm with all my friends. You know, I'm with all like the closest people that I know, and uh, and we're we're talking about this thing that we have in common. We're talking about other things in life as well, and uh, you know, everybody knows each other. It's just a great thing. So this has been like a, a goal of mine for for my life was to get to this point where you know I can live live decently off of jiu -jitsu and I can have a, have a decent life and provide for my family. So I'm just really enjoying the lifestyle and, and continue to welcome people that, that come to want to, they want to learn, they want to train. And, um, and I want to continue to invest in like my competition team, people that want to compete and give them all the tools that they, they want to, uh, to do, do their best out there. So. That's beautiful, man. Well, I, I commend you on all your success, man. It was obviously very well earned, and uh, and I really do appreciate your time today, man. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us here today. Yeah, my pleasure. It's great to chat. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Clark, it's always a pleasure getting to talk with you and pick your brain. I really appreciate you being so generous with all your knowledge and time. And uh, man, you, obviously, you're welcome back on the show anytime you'd like to come back. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's always great to be back on, on, on the show with you and, and BJ Fanatics. I really appreciate that, my friend. For anyone out there that wants to keep up with Clark, it's really easy to do so. He's active on social media. He's got a Facebook page. It's just Clark Gracie. Make sure you guys are following there. Uh, he's very active on Instagram, at Clark Gracie. He's also got a great YouTube channel. It's Gracie Allegiance. Uh, make sure you guys subscribe and hit the little bell icon to get notified when new videos get added. Uh, if you guys are interested in uh, checking out his academy in San Diego or attending one of his seminars or just keeping up with what he's up to in general check out clarkgracie.com that's a great uh, really easy place to keep up with all that information uh, if you guys are ever traveling through san diego definitely drop into his school if you're not ever going to travel through san diego and you still want to learn from clark uh, he's got two great instructionals with us here at bjjfanatics.com uh, the one we covered in depth today is the automatic oma plata system so if oma plotters are something you're wanting to improve this is one of the best sources in the world to learn it from he's also got a tremendous uh kimura instructional with us here that you guys should definitely check out as well and uh and clark one more time i really do appreciate your time thank you ryan awesome to be on the show with you guys yeah man i really appreciate uh bg fanatics for uh having me on the show and uh promoting my my instructionals uh, it's a great way for me to be able to to share with the community everything that i've invested over the couple decades that i've been training jiu-jitsu and um i also want to thank leon optics for just making like the best sunglasses out there and uh it's it's been been great working with those guys and they even made like gracie allegiance uh style uh sunglasses and also juju theater for just having like the sickest gear in, in jiu-jitsu so thank you for making that lifestyle stuff 
Awesome. Well, Clark, we really do appreciate your time and your knowledge today, my friend. Thank you for coming on once more. And, uh, and that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast.